Who is this person who claimed in the 19th century to bring a new revelation from God? Why did he willingly undergo 40 years of hardship and deprivation to demonstrate the validity of his beliefs? Why have over 6 million people in 200 countries and some 127,000 localities chosen to become followers of Baha'u'llah? Kia ora. <laughs> uh, my name is Ilona Warren and I want to welcome you to Baha'i On Air. Uh, we have a very special guest today, Linda Kavlin Popov, one of the three founders of The Virtues Project. In 1991, Linda, her husband Dr. Dan Popov and her brother John Kavlin founded this wonderful model. And here we have in the studio with us Linda Kavlin Popov. Well, Linda, welcome. Thank you, Alona. Linda, how did this model start? What was the what was the, the 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 event that prompted you three to create this amazing world embracing model? Well, there actually was an event that was our founding event. We call it our aha moment when John was visiting Dan and me up in British Columbia, Canada, and we on the last day of our visit. We took him for a special treat for brunch at the Empress Hotel in the harbor at Victoria. Mm. And we were talking about the state of the world. And as a psychotherapist who had worked with many families, and my husband, Dan, who was a clinical pediatric psychologist, we were very concerned about the level of violence amongst children by themselves, toward themselves, and toward each other. And we thought, what has happened to these children? We put our heads together and said, you know, we have, among the three of us, writing skills, presenting skills, research skills, and design skills. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could use those to create materials to help children and families everywhere? And um, it is a miraculous thing that after that several days of just quiet reflection, three words seem to appear out of nowhere. The Virtues Project. And once we heard those words, we literally sat down and filled sheets of paper with, what does this mean? What would this be? What would it look like? What would the programs and the publications be? And ultimately, we settled on a book for kids and their parents that was then called The, the Virtues Guide. We later called it The Family Virtues Guide. And one of us, we could never remember which one, said, Someone should do something about that. And we looked at each other and said, why don't we? And that's how it started. And John was working at that time as an Imagineer for the Disney company, for Walt Disney Imagineering. And so he took a flying leap of faith and left, much to their chagrin, because <laughs> they really loved having him there. And he came up and stayed with us in our little cottage. Mm -hmm. And we had what we called our Summer of Discernment. And that's how it all began. Is it a Baha'i project? No, the Virtues Project is not a Baha'i program. Um, I would be untruthful if I didn't say that its, um, its appreciation of the diversity of global culture and the history of religion uh, was not inspired by the Baha'i belief that the humankind is one and the religions of mankind are all chapters in the same book. But as a program, it is designed for the world's children, the world's families, the world's schools. It does not favor any particular religion. It has no religious agenda at all. Um, in fact, for the school programs in our new um, Virtues Project Educator's Guide, all references to a divine being have had, for the most part, to be eliminated because the schools find that a very dicey subject. Um, but it doesn't mean that the program does not still contain wonderful inspirational quotes from all sorts of other sources. And now, Linda, it's in over 95 countries. It's actually up over 102 now. Wow, 102. <laughs> well, you know, the first book, which is our classic, you know, The Family Virtues Guide, it really came for a longing that every child in the world 
would have a parent mirror to them, this is who I see when I see you. I see a person of kindness, I see a person of compassion, of excellence, of joyfulness, of self-discipline. It is how we help the children to act on that potential. And that concept had been with the three of us since, for John and me, since we were children, because we were raised in the Baha'i faith. And the Baha'i belief is that we're not born in original sin, we're born in original potential. Hmm. We're born with the potential to be in the image of God. The image and likeness of God means that we reflect the divine qualities. Because if you ask, well, who is God? What is the creator? creator is peace, love, justice, and we have in our souls the imprint of the divine. During the years since 1991, you have undergone a grueling traveling schedule. Yes. You are a charismatic speaker. And uh, I mean, how many times have you been just to visit us here in New Zealand over the years. At least a dozen times. Yeah. Which and that's a great just, pleasure, I must oh, say. Oh, well, we love having you. And that's just New Zealand because yeah. you have visited also the islands in the South Pacific. Oh, yes. We've done a lot of work in the South Pacific. But also, you're an author. Mm -hmm. And during that time, you have written a wonderful book called Sacred Moments, which is now unable to be bought because it has run out and people are scrambling through Amazon to find second hand <laughs> copies. <laughs> is there, are there going to be, is there another oh, print yes. coming we're, we're actually going to publish it in the next month on Create Space on Amazon so yeah. people can have it as a book or as an e-reader book. So um, that's coming back, you know, and I'm really happy there is a demand for it. The next book you wrote was called The Pace of Grace. Right. Now, what was the event or what happened in your life to inspire you to write this book? Well, I think partly because we were away from home and traveling at least 80% of the time, we would just come home and then we'd leave again. And I think that the, the growing responsibility for this huge global project, which was very grassroots, but just kept growing, 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 I think it triggered um, what was going to happen anyway, which was an episode of post-polio syndrome for me, because I'd had polio as a child. And now they're finding that people in their 50s who have had polio when they were children develop the symptoms of post-polio. So I became very ill. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't speak anymore for quite a while. and. I felt the inspiration during meditation of how to heal myself. And so I followed that and I wrote a book about it because I knew so many people mm. were suffering from energy diseases, either from exhaustion, adrenal exhaustion, or chronic fatigue. And I've had wonderful feedback that for many of them, including people with MS, multiple sclerosis, that this is the first program, if you will, my 10 rules for health, mm -hmm. that actually helped them to recover. And those 10 rules for health came in a very, I don't know if you want to hear that part. Oh yeah. But um, one time I told this on the radio and I was asked if I felt like I were Moses or somebody <laughs> because the 10 rules for health came to me all of a sudden one day when I, I thought I was near death, I could hardly breathe. Um, I had to crawl out to the living room to my prayer corner and I just called out to God and said, help me, am I supposed to get ready to die now? I don't know what to do. And I heard this voice, which had been very remote for me during this period when I was becoming ill. My brain was very mushy and I couldn't meditate anymore, which is a terrible mm. loss for me. But I heard this voice saying, I will give you 10 rules for health, follow them, write them down and follow them. So I did, and they all started with a P. It was just, and I just wrote as quickly as I could. And it was everything from pace yourself, to play, to pray every hour, to plan a sustainable life. It was a, an incredible, holistic approach to health recovery. 
and it's I'm in a very miraculous state of health now, you know, almost yeah. two decades later, uh, because I'm as long as I follow those rules and I balance rest and movement, I'm in great health. The balance. The balance. the balance and the book, A Pace of Grace, yes. is really about how do we find our mental, spiritual, and physical balance. And also, how do we balance in our relationships between intimacy rather than enmeshment? Um, how do we find that, that divine balance? I've uh, read this book often with members of my community who are older. Um, but it's just recently that I've begun to see how these both the virtues model and the pace of grace mesh oh, into yes. each other. Yes. Because within both of them, there are the virtues cards, which are so attractive to people mm -hmm. to call them to their silence and to their prayerful mm -hmm. space. Um, subsequent to getting better, you've started traveling Again. I did. I'll tell you, the first time that I was able to travel after I had been that ill, um, I didn't have a title for the book yet. And I hadn't really started writing it. And we went to the Cook Islands. We were invited there by an international women's group to help in community development. And there was this huge group of people that had come together, mm. everything from people that had canoed in from villages to the Minister of Health and the Minister of Education. And I was sitting on the bed thinking, I've, I haven't stood in front of a group and I certainly haven't done a five-day intensive on the Virtues Project for so long. And I just had a little prayer and I just said, how am I going to do this? And the words I heard were, keep a pace of grace. I thought, that sounds like a great title for a book. But what was interesting is that I realized <clears throat> as I went through that particular experience, and I sat sometimes and sometimes I stood, but it was the most grace-filled training, if you want to call it mm. that, that I had ever done or facilitated because it followed the pace that people needed and that I needed and it was very in-depth and there was no pressure you have to learn these five strategies mm -hmm. in five days it was just let's experience this together and so it went very deep for the people and the Minister of Education who told me at the very beginning that he couldn't stay he had too many meetings as soon as he heard my opening keynote he came up and said can I stay mm -hmm. I said, you can stay as long as you like. And he did. And he was one of the great performers of these skits, you know, oh, wow. and songs at the end. Create in me a pure heart, oh my God, oh my God, and renew a trust. my hope through the spirit of power confirm thou me in thy cause oh my best beloved confirm thou me in thy cause and by If you've just joined us, 
uh, we are talking to Linda Kavlin Popov, who's the founder of the Virtues Project. Linda, these two models that you have now published, because of course the Pace of Grace is now a four session workshop, mm -hmm. again being done everywhere in the world yes, by it is. all races. Yeah. And, and this universality of the language you speak, meaning that mm. anyone can, can access it. You don't yes. have to be an academic, you can be French, Spanish. Inuit, you know, Inuit, Eskimo, That's Aboriginal, right. Maori, it doesn't matter, it speaks to our hearts. Yes. But now your skills seem to have been to use what you've experienced in life as a human being and to reflect on those experiences and then write them down in such yes. a way that you have communicated them to mm -hmm. your audience. Now, Linda, I'll just put my glasses on because I wanted to read this. I think it's very important. It leads on to something I want to ask you. The model was honoured by the United Nations during the International Year of the Family as a model global programme for families of all cultures. That's huge. I know. <laughs> to me, that's been one of the most marvellous and surprising things of how many cultures have embraced the Virtues Project, but it's because it's in everyone's tradition, yeah. everyone's belief, is the virtues are what really matter. Love is what matters. Gratitude yeah. is part of the Ho'oponopono that is the making amends at the end of life. It's very Polynesian. It's here in New Zealand. It's in Hawaii. And um, it's about gratitude, forgiveness, and love. And it's expressing that and finding that. So, yeah. so when the United Nations honoured you like that, mm -hmm. suddenly the great woman herself <laughs> gave you a ring, and you yeah. were invited to go on the Oprah show. Now yes, that is it was. huge, Linda. It was. It was. Every absolutely. woman around the world watches that program, and, and every woman wants to be on her show. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about it. Well, I found her smaller than I thought she was, yeah. but bigger in spirit. What an amazing spirit. And she featured the virtues, the Family Virtues Guide and me on the show, on a show about doing the right thing. And she had featured some stories of people that paid their employees after a fire because they didn't want them to lose their livelihood. People who were heroes. And then she said, how do you raise children? You know, kids don't come with a guidebook of how to make them into good people. Mm. But this is one. She holds up the Family Virtues Guide, and um, she was wonderful. I was very ill at the time with post-polio, so I had to lie down until I had to walk out on stage. And it wasn't, you know, a performance that I would have loved, mm. but it was great to be with her. And one time when the camera went off and we were, they went to commercial, I said, Oprah, can I tell you what I think your core virtue is? And she said, sure. <laughs> and I said, it's reverence. She said, you got that right. That's why I'm the happiest girl in the USA. <laughs> and she, she said, this is a fantastic book. You know, you have to get this book. Yeah. So, of course, a lot of people did. Exactly. Yeah. And that led on <clears throat> for you, for television shows yourself. That's right. We were invited by Vision TV, which is the main interfaith um, and cultural sh show on, or channel on, um, in Canada to do a series, and we were then invited to do a second series. And it was called Virtues of Family Affair. And it was working with groups of parents and kids and showing how the Virtues Project was spreading around Canada, how the First Nations people were using it. Mm. It's a, a series that's very dear to my heart. And I hear it gets played again and again. It does, they just keep repeating it. Mm. People who stay up late at night now get to see it. And there was a second series about virtues with teens. And we went to the most amazing places to work with teens who had been on the streets, who had been prostitutes and so on, and who were looking for a way to, to recover their lives. And the Virtues Project helped them to do that. When we are living our best lives, our most successful lives, our most 
spiritually whole lives and healthy lives, we are actually reflecting those virtues in everything we do, in our relationships to ourself, first of all, that we see the beauty in ourselves, that we see the beauty in others. And so that's how it started. And I've, I have felt that call because every time we would teach parents about how to raise the children, we'd find this poor self-esteem in the parent. And like people were saying, I wish I could think about this every day for myself. So that's how Sacred Moments came about. That was the second book. And then A Pace of Grace came out of my health challenges. And I really love the fact that, that when I would receive healing words and healing assistance, I wanted to share that with others. So then, my beloved brother John died, mm -hmm. my little brother. And Dan and I had this incredible privilege of caring for him when he was dying of brain cancer. And <clears throat> we just canceled all our travels and we chose to stay with him. And what we discovered, and I think I knew this intellectually maybe, but I didn't really know it, is that the five strategies of the Virtues Project are really applicable from the time a baby is born, even before the mama can whisper and the daddy can whisper who they hope this child will be or how they're going to welcome the child in as a person of great capacity. And certainly as a baby, that they use that language and they use those strategies to honor the child. It's also, it's from birth to death that how do we give people a graceful end of life experience? Because John had a beautiful experience as we did in caring for him because of the five strategies. What is the title of the book? This new book is called Graceful Endings, Navigating the Journey of Loss and Grief. And I believe this last weekend you have visited New Zealand yet again yep. and you have been giving wonderful workshops to just so many of your facilitators. Very interesting, so many of them coming mm. from schools, yes. but also from other well, walks of life yes. and also people who work in prisons. Yeah. That that was very interesting oh, yes. to me. Absolutely. You've been so successful in that area, in that area of raising self-esteem. Oh yes. Very often I'll say to people that I'm working with in a prison, today I'm going to introduce you to somebody very special and very important. And they're going, yeah, you. And I say, it's you. And that gets their attention. And I promise you that you will learn a new language, a language which can keep you in touch with the powers you have and the virtues of other people. I've been to Arahata, how do we, Arahata Women's Prison many times, Wellington, several times. And they first watched me for about five minutes. Is this woman for real? Mm. Or is she going to preach at us about virtues? And then they get it, and I just see the shift. Mm. And they just don't want me to leave. You know, it, it's because I'm telling them who they are. I'm reminding them of who they really are. And that's really the whole purpose of the Virtues Project. If, <clears throat> if all these kids could have what these children are, were getting the Virtues Project have, there wouldn't be anybody left in the prisons. And the other night you launched Graceful Endings. I did. And it was a wonderful invitation from the team of master facilitators in the project that invited me to do that. It was a real gift to me. And people came to hear about the book. And um, I just want it to be a gift to not only people who are caregivers or who have lost someone they love or something they love, but I, I want it to be for people who are dying. How do they create a graceful ending? As John did, he was amazing the way he faced his death. And again, we come back to the teachings that we had as children and that we've followed throughout our lives of the Baha'i Faith. Because he, well, I'll tell you a story. We were going to see the palliative care physician 
whose name, I think it's so funny that his name is Dr. Crossland. <laughs> he never made the connection until I mentioned it to him. I said, isn't that the perfect name for what you do? He went, oh. <laughs> and he's known to be quite the chatterbox, you know. So we would go in there and he would talk for an hour to John about what could happen to his tumor and what could do. And John's like, he didn't remember anything afterwards. And I'm sitting there thinking, I didn't want to know this. But he was, John really liked him. He'd say, isn't he lovely? And I'd say, oh, yes. <laughs> thinking, why didn't he ask John anything? Well, this time he did. This was another visit. And it was much closer to the time that John died. And Dr. Crossland looked at him and said, you know, I've never met anybody who faced death with this peace that you have, with such peace. Why? And John sat back, you know, and he said, well, I've always loved change. Oh. <laughs> he said, I've always loved the new. <laughs> he said, I'm really looking forward to the next world. <laughs> and he said, in our faith, Prayer is conversation with God, and death is reunion with the beloved. And so I have nothing to fear. I'm not afraid. In fact, he said, I'm so excited I can hardly wait. And, you know, his brother, his twin Tommy and I were sitting there. <laughs> and he's sitting there beaming. He was just radiant. And much of it was how he chose to face his death. And he made a decision that it was going to be an adventure. So what is the Baha'i position on life and death? Well, the, what Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, says about life after death is, he says, I have made death a messenger of joy unto thee, wherefore dost thou grieve? And John took that to heart. The day that I found him weeping, I thought he was weeping because he realized this horrible tragedy. i had been doing a lot of weeping, he hadn't. And when I found him weeping, I thought, he's finally seen the light. This is a horrible thing happening. But he said, when I asked him, what are those tears? He said, it's so beautiful. And what he was referring to was that all morning he'd been reading the Baha'i writings, what Baha'u'llah said about what happens to us in the next world, that we are more ourselves, that we recognize one another, that there are many worlds of God, that this one that we live in here is to help us develop those potential virtues that are our birthright. And when we die, we simply go to a bigger room. It's like an open door into a bigger room. And it's like a bird that's been in a cage and now it gets to fly free into a much wider world. And so John was looking forward to seeing all his friends that have gone on and our parents so it's reunion with God, and it's also reunion with, with the people you love. So um, there are more rich explanations of life after death in the Baha'i teachings than any that I've seen in the other sacred texts. And the thing is, the Virtues Project is based on all the faiths, including the oral traditions of indigenous people. And the Baha'i faith is one of the most marvelous resources for information on the soul and where we're going. Thank you, Linda. You're welcome. I have made death a messenger of joy to thee. Wherefore dost thou grieve? And I made the light to shed on thee its splendor. Why dost thou veil thyself there? from why dost thou veil thyself why dost thou veil thyself there from why dost thou veil thyself
myself 